Good morning. Oh, good, it's working. Um, welcome to Faith Bible Church. I invite you this morning to open your Bibles to the 14th chapter of John, uh, looking specifically at verses 25 through 27. The subject of today's message is the peace that comes from God, a topic that is perhaps one of the most continuously relevant and needful subjects for the church, the body of believers, to be reminded of and encouraged through. This is, of course, the third of the fruits of the Spirit in the great list of Galatians 5.22. I say relevant because the world we live in has many ways of attempting to steal our peace, for it is one of the most powerful testimonies the believer may express. Sometimes we are attacked physically by enemies. Sometimes the circumstances we find ourselves in simply shout for unrest and unease. And sometimes we ourselves give up the peace that is our right when we give in to fear or temptation and forget to walk in the way that has been set before us. I hope to show you today what the peace of God looks like, why it should not be that we are able to be robbed of that peace, and how to reclaim the peace that is our right as children of God if we have lost track of it. Let us open our Bibles then and read John 14, verses 25 through 27. These things I have spoken to you while I am still with you, but the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled. Neither let them be afraid. Let us pray. Dear Lord, we pray that you would open our hearts to hear your word. Let us be sensitive to the instruction of your spirit, that we may see the patterns of unrest in our own hearts, as well as how to bring our walk closer to being fully in step with your will and your glory. We seek not our own will, but yours, for you are the author of your universe, worthy of all glory and honor and praise. Walk with us, guide us through your spirit to help us bring to your name the honor and glory that you are due. Help us to see your peace and rest in it. This we pray in accordance with Jesus' power and purpose. Amen. There are many factors that tempt us to live not in the place of peace, but of fear and anxiety. Hostile human activity has long been a cause of fear and anxiety, of fear and pain, robbing many of the comfort that comes from resting in the peace of God. Our own thoughts may likewise betray us, tempting us to abandon peace for panic, anxiety, and doubt. And the natural outcomes of living in a world so thoroughly tainted by sin death, disease, disasters, these too may also tempt us to abandon God's peace, to live in anger, resentment, doubt, or fear. Indeed, the world we live in is fundamentally opposed to God and everything that gives him glory. What Jesus said to the Pharisees can easily be said to so many in today's world. Why do you not understand what I say? It is because you cannot bear to hear my word. You are of your father the devil, and your will is to do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning, and does not stand in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character, for he is a liar and the father of lies. But because I tell you the truth, you do not believe me. Since the world then is opposed to God, it is opposed also to us who belong to him. The prince of this world, the devil, prowls like a roaring lion, seeking to devour all that he can, and to tear apart what he cannot devour. It is no wonder, then, that the world is filled with terrors on every side. War, plague, famine, disasters. Sin stains the world and fills it with death and wickedness. Our own flesh works against us as well. Paul cries out, Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? We are living souls tethered still to the fallen flesh that we were born into. 
so many temptations come from within us, from our sinful flesh. Temptation to rely on our own strength, to seek security in large bank accounts, to glorify ourselves and our accomplishments with fine clothes, fancy cars, and homes. We are tempted to think, how righteously am I living, while all the time our pet sins crouch behind the door, ready to pounce on us and curl up in our laps as we stroke them and feed them. Those sins of pride, covetousness, or self-reliance. These, at least, are called virtue in our world today. Pride. Each person is empowered to define reality or morality as it suits them. Covetousness. Advertising and the free market encourage us to be discontent with what we have already, to get more, to buy more, newer, bigger, better idols. And self-reliance. Be independent. Stand apart from your fellow man. Store up food for yourselves, land, money. No one will give you what is needful when hard times appear, and neither should you be expected to give to others in their need. Do these, sound, do these things sound like you? Have I struck a chord that rings jarringly, dissonantly in your heart? Brothers and sisters, I hope not. But I see in myself the seeds of these sins. And until we are freed from the sinful flesh we dwell in now, we will need to be vigilant against them. But none of these things fallen humanity, the sin-stained world, or the body of death we each of us wrestle with, none of these should be able to strip us of peace. They shouldn't, but sometimes they still do. We are not perfect. Indeed, we will not be perfect until we are restored fully in spirit and flesh by Christ himself on the final day. But the peace of Christ should rule in our hearts, just as the word of Christ should dwell in us richly, as Paul writes to the Colossians in chapter 3 of that letter. And in 2 Thessalonians, he writes, May the Lord of peace himself give you peace at all times in every way. Again, in Philippians chapter 4, And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, Christ himself says in our passage for today, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. So let us start at the beginning of the verse. These things I have spoken to you while I am still with you. The things that Jesus is speaking of here are his final lessons for his disciples before he is taken away from them, tried, and executed. He has told them yet again of the very nature of his being, what he is about to do, and what the disciples will do in the aftermath of his arrest and crucifixion. He spoke to them of his love for them, his enduring watch care and protection. He again told them of his divine nature and his unity with the Father. He spoke to them of how they should be towards one another, how they should be different from the world, being of service to one another, counting others as more than themselves. He spoke to them of the privilege they will have, able to ask the Father for anything as they walk in his commandments. These men had the inestimable privilege to walk beside the Lord and see and hear everything he did, to eat the bread blessed by him beside the sea which fed 5,000 men. They saw him raise Lazarus from the dead. They saw him walk across the Sea of Galilee. They listened as he taught the people. They heard him explain the mysteries of the parables. They could ask him anything at any time, and he would answer their questions. How blessed were they to be chosen as his disciples. But even given all that, it is only a prelude, for he has a greater promise. But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. Even now, after witnessing Jesus' entire earthly ministry, seeing his great works and hearing every message he preached, the disciples still did not really understand whose they were and whom they served. 
that would not fully come until this promise was fulfilled on the day of Pentecost, after which their lives, their motives, and their hearts were fully immersed in the Spirit of God. We say a radical change from the fearful, cowering disciples who fled and hid and denied after Jesus, after Jesus was arrested, to the bold, defiant, confident apostles who stood before the Sanhedrin and declared, Let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man is standing before you well. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. This boldness and confidence and understanding was nowhere to be found in these men before Jesus sent his spirit to teach them, even though they walked at his side for years. Let me tell you something. This same Spirit He sent on them is right now inside each one of us. We too have been transformed, if indeed we have trusted in Him for our salvation. We have been purchased with His blood, filled with His Spirit. We are being instructed by the eternal God who created the universe. How can we not have peace within us as well? And that is exactly what He says. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. The same confidence and assurance that astounded the counsel of the Jews is ours as well, for we belong to the same God, and He has done all the work. It is His will that draws us to Himself, and His power that holds us safely in His hands. We have but to trust in Him and love Him, both of these things he himself, he himself enables and empowers us to do. This is how we have his peace. It is no less than the assurance of our salvation. So as our confidence and our vision of him is clear, so too will our peace be steadfast and constant. Do you feel as though you lack this peace? Then look upon him whom they have pierced. See him, see what he has done for you, the price he has paid, the fullness of his love and of his power. And when you see him clearly, you will feel his peace. So what exactly does this peace look like? How can we tell if we are dwelling in that peace? What should our lives look like when we are guarded in our hearts and minds by the peace of God? The best place to look for the answer to these questions is, of course, in the example of the Prince of Peace himself, the Lord Jesus Christ. The peace we see in our Lord is deep and abiding, for he lived constantly in view of his Father, knowing with confidence that he was walking in the will and power of the Father of all. Jesus confronted the Pharisees time and again, arguing the truth to combat the lies that they lived in, to spur them out of the house of their father, the devil. Though they many times sought to stone him or arrest him, he knew his father's will and walked in it. This does not mean that the peace that Jesus knew meant that he never suffered anguish or distress. Jesus wept at the death of Lazarus, even as he knew in a short while Lazarus would be walking out of the tomb. We likewise are told to weep with those who weep. It is no bad thing to feel pain at being parted from one we love. Indeed, this is a most natural reaction, and were we not to feel that pain, we would have a lack of that most vital fruit, namely love. But alongside grief, we too have the abiding peace flowing deeper than our pain. For we know who our Father is, and we know He is more than in control. But He orders all things, even painful things, for our good and for His glory. Christ knew before He stood Lazarus' tomb that He would call Him out of it. And that peace did not depart from Him, even as He stood weeping with Mary. This is compassion and empathy, not fear and loneliness. 
in the Garden of Gethsemane, we see again our Lord in distress, a most understandable distress, for he saw more clearly than any of us what was soon to befall him. But still, it was not sinful fear that he found himself in, though being human, I am sure he was tempted to that fear. But being God in flesh, he did not give in to that temptation. For he still had constantly his eye upon his Father, who looked back at him in love. Christ had his peace there as well in that time of great distress, distress at the certainty of being separated from the holy God who sustained and walked with him every moment of his existence. He prayed even that if it were possible, the cup might pass from him. But even more, he prayed that the Father's will be done. Jesus rested in the will and power of the Father, confident even in that dark hour that all would, indeed, must be done for the good of those who love him and also to the glory of the all-glorious God, which is the source of all joy and peace for Christ in that moment, and all the more should be comfort and peace for us. Paul as well knew the peace of God, it was joy to him to be beaten, imprisoned, opposed, and chained for the gospel of Christ. He writes in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not driven to despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed, always carrying in the body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our bodies. We see this lived out in example when Paul and Silas were in prison in Philippi at midnight after being arrested at the whim of the mob and beaten by Roman authorities. They were singing hymns and praying in their chains. They were not shaking in terror at the thought of being executed or even ill-treated. They abided in the peace that comes from Christ, knowing that they served a master who was who not only cared, but had power to work his will, and that will which none could gainsay or oppose. And this is the crux of it. We know who our master is, and more than his name, we know his character. When we have a clear understanding of Christ's work on the cross, his resurrection from the dead, and his love for all those who come to him, whom he will never cast out, when we see this clearly, we also cannot but help be comforted and filled with the peace of Christ, the peace which comes from Christ, the peace which our Father extends to us when we lay down our rebellious hearts and repent and come to Him. His peace is forever, and He will not cast us back into despair. He is strong enough to hold us through all trials, Indeed, no trial comes to us except through his will, and his will is not that we should be destroyed. Far from it. His will is that we should be cleaned, sanctified, refined, made fit for his kingdom. How can we fear when we know that any trial or test or hardship that comes to us comes to us as we sit in his loving hands? And even if the trial should come to pain or even to death, what is that to us? For to die is merely to speed to his side, to see him face to face. And that is such a peace indeed. So it is that though we too may be afflicted, but we know that we are in his hands and shall never be crushed. We too may be perplexed, but comforted by his love, we should never despair. We too may be persecuted. Indeed, we should expect persecution to increase as we become more like our master. But in the persecution, we will never be abandoned or forsaken by our father. We may even be struck down even to death, but we cannot be destroyed for our names are in his book of life. Every pain we suffer that comes from a world that hates its creator is indeed a mark we bear alongside Christ. We should rejoice that we are counted so near our master in action and word to be worthy to suffer as he did on our behalf. 
How can I say this? Let us read further in verse 27. Not as the world gives do I give to you. He gives us peace, and not like the world gives. How does the world give? The world gives grudgingly, conditionally, or not at all in spite of its promises. The best the world can offer in terms of peace is a short respite from want, though often when we look to the world for peace, we trade one kind of unrest for another. Though our woes on one side are abated for a time, we have new ones ready to hand to fill the prior woe's place. This is not how Christ gives anything, least of all his peace. He gives freely, fully, abundantly, overflowingly. He gives in good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. Ephesians 3.20 says we are not even able to comprehend how abundantly he gives. He gives us not only the gift, but the tools and power to use the gift as well. And why does he do this? To glorify the Father. When we, fallen sinful beings, stand tall in righteousness and truthfulness, we bring glory to him who effected such a change in dead, useless creatures such as we used to be. And the peace that we have seen today, that peace is such a testimony of God's power in a world ruled by fear. And that is why we are to let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. We have the full power and peace of him in our hearts. This is a command from our Lord. Do not allow your hearts to be troubled or afraid. He makes us able to obey the command. But how do we do this? Once again, we remember who he is and what he has done for us. If we allow ourselves to be fearful, anxious, fretful, what are we doing but forgetting that we are bought and paid for by the blood of Christ? We are looking once again to our own strength or to the vague, capricious movements of this world to provide for our comfort and safety. This is not where our help comes from. Trust in Him who is your true help. Do not trust in anything but Him. When we look back at our vain idols, we do him dishonor. We bring shame on his name, for it shows to the world we don't trust in our God. We don't believe that he truly has the power to sustain us. So when the persecutions come, when the trials come, when the hard things of this life surround us and overwhelm us, even when death is threatening on all sides, even in the most extreme hardship, Still, we should not be robbed of his deep and abiding peace. Indeed, we cannot be robbed of this peace unless we ourselves hand over the key to the enemy and allow him to take it from us. When the winds of doubt and trouble blow around you, what is it that you cast your eye upon? Is it the wind and waves which threaten you? Do you look upon your trouble and thinking only of your small ability and power? Do you fret and worry, stress and groan? Or do you look upon the tall waves surrounding you and then look above and beyond them to the God who is so much greater, whose eye is upon you with love and tender watch care? God's love for us and his majesty and power should be our first thought when we arise, our last thought when we lie down, and the constant thread of comfort, reassurance, and peace which binds our days together between. If we let our hearts be troubled, it is because we have forgotten our Father's face, his power, his love. I say it again, there is nothing that comes to us that is not out of his hand. We need to abide in his love, and trouble will not come near our hearts. Near our heads, perhaps, near our hands, certainly, but when that trouble comes, it is for us to show our trust in him by leaning on him in the midst of that trouble. For we know that he cares for us and is intent on building us up. Yes, we lean on the Lord who gives us all his peace. And by relying on his strength when ours fails, this brings glory to his name. Even so, 
Given all that we have seen of his grace and mercy, peace and love, we are not yet perfect in our sanctification. Sometimes we do lose hold of our peace. Sometimes we do give in to despair, to fretfulness, to fear. If we do lose sight of Christ, are we lost then? I hope, dear friends, that you know what my answer is going to be before I say it. I expect many of you are already thinking it. No. For our peace and salvation and comfort do not rely on us. It is not our will that brings us peace. It is the peace of God. It is His peace that He gives to us constantly, abundantly, eternally. We have but to lift up our eyes to Him, to look upon His face again, and remember who we are, children of the Most High God. Who can snatch us out of His hand? Turn from the foolish things you have briefly set your sight on and look to the light of the world. Be filled with his comfort and walk as in the light. Repent, turn, and be united with God. How is this done? Simply, so simply, go to him and seek him in his word. Do this every day. No, it may not be easy at first, for our enemy seeks to throw obstacles in our path to hurt us as much as possible, and keeping us from seeing our Father's face is the surest way to steal from us our joy and peace. And when you look into his word, do not merely read the words on the page to add another check mark on your to-do list. This is not a chore to be done as quickly as may be done to move on to other things. Sit down and pray. Ask him to reveal himself to you in his word. And when you read, Read to understand, to know, seek out something new in it, for there will be something new, even if you read the same section every day for a month, for a year. And when you have read, reflect on what you read, meditate on his word, think about it, roll it over and over in your mind. God shows himself to us in his word. And when we see him clearly, that is when we are best able to follow his example. When we see him clearly, that is when we can easily look beyond the troubles that surround us and see him above the trouble and beside us. When we see him clearly, that is when we love him most dearly. And when we love him, we obey him, we walk in his presence, and we feel him with us. Perhaps you do spend time really reading his word every morning and praying before you start the day. Do you find yourself losing sight of him as the day wears on? Then pick up his word again. Sit down in prayer. Open it at lunch and seek him again. Read the word every hour if you need to. Pray constantly. Do not allow the enemy to steal your peace. He can only take it from you if you hand it over yourself. Remember who you are. Remember what he did, what it cost him. He took our sins upon himself. He willingly went to the cross and bore the punishment that we all deserve. He took the curse for us, purchasing our souls, our lives, with every drop of his blood. He endured the full wrath of the Holy One that our sin demanded. He did this out of love for us. He died that we might live. He rose again from the dead to prove his word is truth. And as he rose, so too we will rise on the last day to the eternal glory of our Father, who defeated death, fear, and mourning. We will rise at the dawning of his eternal peace. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for the peace that you have given to us through your Son, Jesus the Messiah, through his sacrifice in our place, and through his glorious resurrection, bringing praise to your name. We thank you as well for sending to us your Holy Spirit to teach us and guide us. Let us therefore be sensitive to his work, refresh our hearts through him. If any here lack the desire to know you better, I pray especially now that you would touch that heart of stone and replace it with a heart of flesh to know you and love you and bring you glory. 
Let us all, Lord, be seeking you first of all and most of all. Let us all bring you the glory you deserve through hearts that know your perfect peace. You love us, Lord. Help us to love you better. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, who was crucified and whom you raised from the dead, we pray. Amen. Amen.